As we turn now to the legendary TV producer and longtime political activist Norman Lear. At 94 years young, Norman Lear has led a remarkable life. He helped revolutionize sitcom television with a string of hit shows, including All in the Family, Sanford and Son, The Jeffersons, Good Times, and Maud. In 1984, he became one of the first seven television pioneers to be inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame. In 1999, President Clinton awarded him the National Medal of Arts, saying, quote, Norman Lear has held up a mirror to American society and changed the way we look at it. Yes, Norman Lear is also a longtime activist, earning him a place on Richard Nixon's enemies list and the scorn of the Christian right. In 1981, he created the progressive advocacy group People for the American Way, in part to monitor the religious right. The late Jerry Falwell once described Lear as the number one enemy of the American family. Well, Norman Lear is a subject of the new American Masters documentary on PBS called Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You. It premieres tonight on PBS. This is a trailer. Television can be broken into two parts, before Norman and after Norman. This is a period of time where we were at our, probably our greatest change socially. Mainstream television was one of the last things to jump, and the first person to force it over that hill was Norman. All in the family was the greatest. Do you have a quick answer for the people who say uh, the show reinforces bigotry? Yes, very my quick answer is no. I never said a guy who wears glasses is a queer. A guy who wears glasses is a four eyes. A guy who is a fag is a queer. Who used to say is too hip for the room. There weren't any African Americans on TV at that time, and I didn't want to disparage a black family. She's the fuse that sets off kid dynamite! There are lines that were meant for you to say because you were black. It's time for God's people to come out of the churches and change America! I was concerned about what I was seeing on television, mixing politics and religion. So I thought, I want to take the flag back for all of us. He called me and said, guess what? I own the Declaration of Independence. The trailer for Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You. It premieres tonight on PBS. Well, last week, Norman Lear joined us in our New York studio for a conversation about his work, his politics and his activism. I began by asking him what the title Just Another Version of You means to him. Well, that's been my bumper sticker for a number of years. And when Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady, who produced and directed the film and I think did a brilliant job, they happened to see my bumper sticker one day and they were studying my life and so forth. And they said, that's going to be the title, if you don't mind, of the uh, documentary. And that's the way I feel about it. You know, we are versions of one another in our common humanity, whatever our color, whatever our ethnicity, whatever, you know, uh, on the surface uh, makes us individuals. In terms of our common humanity, we are copies of one another. Your father, Herman, had a huge influence on your life. Talk about him. Well, his, <laughs> his absence certainly did. Uh, he was sent to prison when I was nine years old. And uh, that has, in a sense, haunted me and uh, inspired me. Uh, Why he, was he in prison? Uh, he uh, was selling some fake bonds or something. My mother, I remember my mother saying, Herman, I don't like those men. I don't like those men. And uh, Stifle, my father said, as Archie said all those years later, and uh, went off to Oklahoma. He's going to bring me back a 10-gallon hat. Uh, he was arrested when he got off the plane. Two nights later, my mother was selling all the furniture, and we were moving. We couldn't afford to live in Chelsea. She was too ashamed to live Here in Chelsea. Here in New York. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Oh. Yeah, in Chelsea. And, uh, uh, and, and at that moment in time, my mother, my dad away, my mother selling the furniture. I'm going to live with an uncle. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do next. Some big, uh, mature fellow puts his hands on my shoulder and says, well, Norman, you're the man of the house now, at which point I think I began to understand the 
the foolishness of the human condition. So, talk about how you got into television. Well, I, I had one—I <laughs> was a kid of the Depression. I had one Uncle Jack who used to flick me a quarter. That was something, you know, it just knocked me out, that an uncle flicked me a quarter. He was—he said a press agent. I didn't know what a press agent was, but that was my role model. I wanted to be a press agent. I went to California to do that. And uh, our wives, uh, my, my wife and, and uh, my cousin, became great friends. Her husband wanted to be a comedy writer. They were going to the movie one night. We wrote something together. They came home about 10, 15. We went out to a nightclub and sold it. And my half of $40 was, you know, half of what I made in a week. So uh, we started to write comedy. I want to go back to the documentary, Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You. American Masters, Just Another Version of You, yes. American Masters, yes. Um, this is Rob Reiner, who played uh, Mike Stivick, Archie Bunker's son-in-law, on the iconic show, All in the Family, talking about um, the reaction to the series, and it's followed by a clip of All in the Family. The headline is— all in the Family introduces the world to foul-mouthed Archie Bunker. CBS rolled the dice last night with a new situation comedy, All in the Family, which will either be the biggest hit of the season or the biggest bomb. So, here you go. That's, that's what it says. Eight. We did eight seasons. You know you're right, Archie. You're right. The British are a bunch of pansies. Pansies, fairies, and sissies. And the Japanese are a race of midgets. The Irish are boozers. The Mexicans are bandits. And you Polacks are meatheads. <laughs> Reinforcing stereotypes or challenging them? Well, I think for people who understood, and most people did, challenging them. That's why they laughed at them. So talk about All in the and, Family. And, you know, the, those people who thought Archie had it right and wrote letters, and we received, you know, thousands of them, I can't recall a single letter that said, right on, Archie, that didn't—wasn't followed by, but you sons of or you worse than that, or why don't you go back where you came from, Jew, commie, or whatever the hell they, you know, they could find. And uh, it, it, my point being that nobody misunderstood that Archie was, you know, the fool of the piece. Talk about how you came up with All in the Family and when it went on the air. Well, I didn't come up with the—well, I did come up with it. I was uh, doing the Martha Ray show in uh, New York, and uh, a fellow uh, by the name of Phil Sharp, who did— uh, uh, who did, uh, I'm trying to remember the situation comedy at the time, with, with Joan Davis, the Joan Davis show. And uh, he was being divorced with four kids. I was being divorced with one kid. I was in, having a terrible time in my divorce. I asked him how it was going with his. He said, I'm fine. All she wanted was my, uh, my, my uh, reruns, my Joan Davis reruns. At which point I said, well, I'm only doing live to myself. I'm doing live television. I've got to do something that I own. So I decided to do a situation comedy, which I'd never considered doing before. And at that moment, my partner, Bud Yorkin, was in London and wrote me about this show called— uh, uh, I forget, Johnny Spate was the, uh, was the producer, writer. And uh, I heard about that. Uh, and decided I would do an American version of that. And that was—this was about a bigoted father and a son-in-law and so forth. I, and I grew up with that. My father used to call me the laziest white kid he ever met. And I would say, you're putting down a whole race of people to call me lazy? That's not what I'm doing. You're the dumbest white kid I ever met. Well, that actually goes well with this next clip from the documentary. You're appearing on a CBS talk show, and you're questioned about the use of stereotypes and racial epithets in All in the Family. CBS News presents Look Up and Live. 
today, laughter, hurt or heal. I have to say, I have to feel that the laughter hurts, that the repetition of these uh, stereotyped terms that we thought had died tends to be hurtful and harmful to the public good. Well, Mr. Lear, I've heard all these epithets. If they had died, where had they gone to? I don't, did, do you really believe that all in the family resurrected them from, from death? Uh, so uh, my mission is to entertain. I chose to entertain uh, with, with what I consider real people. Norman Lear, what about that? I'm a serious man. I was a serious boy, but I did have a sense of humor. I think I mentioned earlier, I learned the foolishness of the human condition very early in life. Uh, I chose to deal with it, but in a serious way. Before All in the Family came along, I guess the, you know, the kind of a problem they were dealing with on, uh, on uh, Petticoat Junction and Beverly Hillbillies and so forth, uh, the roast was ruined and the boss is coming to dinner. Oh, my goodness, does the family have a problem? We dealt with the things that were going on in our family, extended families, the neighbors across the street, up the street, whether it's menopause or economic uh, problems or, you know, health problems, uh, hypertension and black males and, and the things that crowded our newspapers and our, uh, our imaginations. We dealt with it. Um. Do you think Archie Bunker would have voted for Donald Trump? I think of Donald Trump as the middle finger of the American right hand. The American people, you know, we are a, a, in a democracy. The democracy depends on an informed citizenry, which would be a well-led and informed citizen. I don't think we have a media generally that informs. It yells, it screams, it does bumper sticker. Uh, it doesn't do anything in context. We don't get the news in context. And the American people aching for leadership are tossed uh, a Donald Trump. And I think they say, OK, take this to the—and they're saying, with that middle finger, take this to the rest of us. Let's go to another clip from Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You. This is American Masters. This is CBS's Mike Wallace speaking to Norman about his sometimes tense relationship with the networks. What's your beef against the networks? And I spend hour upon hour arguing with, uh, with the censors about the tiniest things. The network often takes the position that uh, Norman Lear and the, and the others in the creative community, I mean, how can they do this? How can they bite the hand that feeds them? I consider that the creative community are the hands that feed. And they're biting And our they're hands. biting our hands. So there you are talking to the late Mike Wallace. Mm -hmm. What about your relationship with the networks? My relationship with the individuals one-on-one -on -one was pretty good. We understood each other. We were in different—you know, it was, I think it was H.L. Mencken who once said, nobody ever lost money underestimating the intelligence of the American people. Uh, to some degree, the establishment lives with that and makes its decisions on behalf of the American people with that in mind. I disagree. I think, uh, you know, we, we are provably not the best educated, but we're wise of heart, and we understand a lot more than we're given credit for. I'm talking about the population generally. So uh, what we were doing troubled the establishment only because it hadn't been done before. But we were living it. We, we didn't invent any subject we weren't living with. Did you get flack from the networks at the beginning? Like, this isn't going to work. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. I made the show originally for ABC three years before, 1968. And they, I made it twice, each time with, uh, with Carol O'Connor and Gene Stapleton in the leads, different young people. They laughed like hell, I heard from everybody. I was in the room a couple of times, and I could see. Uh, but they didn't put it on. They were afraid of it. 
CBS in the person of a new leader, Bob Wood, uh, put it on with a, what do you call it, advisory, uh, warning people that if they watched it, you know, they might not like it or, or, or they'd be frightened by it or I can't remember those Or they words. might change. Or they might change. Uh, so the last argument we had, we had, uh, they wanted to cut something. New York was on the air three hours before California. They were threatening to cut one line from the show. I said, if you cut it, I'm out of here. I won't be back. I wasn't so brave as that sounds. I had a, an offer of a three-picture deal at United Artists as a result of a film called Turkey I had just finished. Uh, so I was in good shape. Uh, the network, at the last minute, decided they would leave it in. Okay. What and was the line? There wasn't one state that seceded from the union. Uh, Archie comes back from church, having been upset by—didn't like the minister, didn't like the sermon, left the church early. The kids thought they had the house alone. They were upstairs. They walked in. The kids heard them come running down the stairs. It was clear what was, what was happening. They were and, married. And they were married. <laughs> and, uh, and Archie said, 11 o'clock of a Sunday morning. They wanted that line out. But why? I, of course, I said they're married. But it'll cause the audience to picture what he's talking about at 11 o'clock of a Sunday morning. Well, but they knew that when they went upstairs. <laughs> I mean, they <laughs> had to come out. I thought if I gave in to that, I would be giving in to silly forever. And that's why I, I said no. And it was, I was almost on my uh, way out of the office. We were working on the script for the fourth episode when I got a call saying they left it in. Well, that takes us right into reproductive rights and yes. Maud. <laughs> Maud yeah. was a spinoff, right, of yes. All in the Family. So let's turn, in 1972, to an episode of your show, Maud, which tackled the issue of abortion a few months before Roe v. Wade became the law of the land. Look, there's only one sensible way out of this. You don't have to have the baby. It's legal now. You no, know, she's right. It's legal in New York State. You better give that a thought. I have given it a thought. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. The euphemism for censor was program practices. And the program practices department simply didn't want to deal with abortion simply didn't want to deal with abortion. What happened? What happened with this episode of Maud? Well, there was a wonderful man, William Tankersley, who was the head of program practices. And uh, I don't know. I, we, I said we just had to do the, uh, the episode. Uh, we, as a result of his talking with me, we added, we made it a two-parter, we added a character, uh, a woman, a friend, she didn't appear in any other shows, she was there for the purpose of being a mother of four children she couldn't afford, pregnant with a fifth. She would no more think of having an abortion. So she represented in real life the other side of that discussion. On Maud's side, she said to her husband at the closing of the first of that episode, the second episode, Walter, do you think I'm doing the right thing? And he said, Maud, in the privacy of our own home and our own lives, you're doing the right thing. That's the way the two sides were represented, and that was a result of the conversations with Tankersley. Legendary television producer Norman Lear tackling the issue of abortion on network television in 1972, before Roe v. Wade. When we come back, we discuss Norman Lear's activism with him, his fight against the moral majority, and how he ended up on Richard Nixon's enemies list. Stay with us.